Welcome back to Light the Fuse. You know, we said that Tom Cruise is kind of like the pinnacle. We had him for a 200th, but we got somebody in a department just as important today. Charles, do you want to tell everybody who we have on the show? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, as our show is all about, you know, we we celebrate every department and it takes it takes more than a village to make a movie. And today we've got Michael Kehoe, who is also a filmmaker. Uh, but in the case of years ago, he was also craft service for a bunch of movies. And so he was craft service for three different Mission Impossible movies, MI2, MI3 and Ghost Protocol and some other Tom Cruise movies as well. So he's got some great stories for us. And... Craft service is, uh, that's that's an important job. Um, I can tell you that much right now. I remember when I was directing a show, I can't remember if this is the show I was doing in Utah or the show I was doing in Oregon, but it was like a 30-day shoot and it, and it was like, or it might have even been one of them where we shot two seasons, so 60 days. And it wasn't until like the very end of the schedule that I found out that there was this extra craft service truck that you could go on and make special sandwiches on. And I had no idea it was there the whole time because when you're directing, you're just on set, stuck I mean, at least on the scale that I'm doing, where it's like it's 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 a mad dash constantly. So I I just never went over to the other side of set that had this incredible craft service truck that everybody was like, oh my god, you haven't gone over there to make a, a special sandwich in this truck? And I was like, oh man. So anyway, craft service is an important part of the job. Everybody needs some uh, snacks, some pick me up, some coffee, whatever. This is important. Yeah, although the confirmation of uh, Tom Cruise eating M and M's remains out of reach. So if you if you came here for that, you are sorely disappointed. I think he talks about some other stuff though for for yeah. Cruise's uh, Cruise's cheat days. See, he has some great he has some good some good Cruise stories and and some stories about other things too. Doesn't he talk about uh, what is it Last Boy Scout or something from a long time ago? Yeah, he he's yeah. A, a good story from the set of that. Um, there's some good good stuff here, yeah. And and uh, also, I, I wanted to quickly say about our because we've we've now completed, of course, Lightyear: The Fuse was the past three weeks, and we talked about how we weren't sure if there was an IMAX version available, and it turns out that there actually is an IMAX enhanced version on Disney Plus. They call it IMAX enhanced uh, because the aspect ratio goes to 1.9. The normal version is 239 or 235, somewhere around there. It's the very wide uh, picture, and then this one goes to the what they you know jokingly call limax but the limax aspect ratio is 1.9 so it doesn't go to the full 143 that you saw in the true imax theaters but it does go to the 1.9 which is the digital imax which was probably that was most of the imax screens that it played on well do you want speaking of imax do you want to tell people where we were over this over the weekend well that's a good that's another good topic to bring up yeah we went to beyond fest which i think we mentioned in a previous episode that we were we got tickets yeah, we did. We mentioned that. Yeah, so we're, we we made it to Beyond Fest. We went, and Brad Bird did an introduction for the screening and did a little mini Q&A, and Michael Giacchino was there, and we saw some fans of the show, of our, of our show, were there, and they came up and talked to us, which was great. We did a whole Patreon episode giving the whole rundown of this screening and some things about the making of Ghost Protocol that we learned that we hadn't heard before. Uh, yeah, it was, that was, I mean, and, and to see it again in IMAX and we talk about that and how mind blowing it was to see Ghost Protocol in IMAX again. But that, yeah, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to say about that? I mean, it was just mind blowing. No, it was just, it was just a wonderful experience and, um, you know, great to catch up with Bird and, uh, Giacchino and Brian Burke was there. Yes. We got to talk to both of them again. Yeah. And, and again, if you want to hear all the details of this, you got you to sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash light the fuse. You, Charles, you, you cut me off. That was great because you said, you know what? We're not giving this away for free. Go to the Patreon <laughs> to really get the full yes. rundown, which I please. cannot I cannot encourage enough people to do. Support the show, please, and, and sign up for a Patreon. Yes. All right. Well, let's get into it. But of course, first, I have to do my favorite part of the show, which is the shout outs. And I want to just remind everybody that this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album. He just had uh, Better Call Saul uh, executive producer and, and writer and director on there. And he's just got everybody. He, he did a great episode with Eddie Hamilton. So check out his podcast. This episode is also brought to you by John B., Elvis Ripley and Suchet. So without these people, we could not do the show. And if you want to be thanked at the beginning of this episode, give me more work to do in my favorite, you know, my capacity and my favorite part of doing this show. Please go on the Patreon, sign up for the highest level and uh, make it happen. But I think that's it for now, right? We're just going to get into the episode and we'll be back afterwards. Yeah. All right. OK, we'll be back. We're back. 
Michael, tell the folks who you are and what place you hold in the Mission Impossible story. I was, uh, I, I actually did uh, two, three, and four of uh, Mission Impossible. And um, I was hired on as uh, craft service is what I uh, was doing at that time. I moved to California and uh, directed a little short film that went to Sundance. But uh, as a filmmaker, I didn't, you know, have enough money to survive. So I had gotten my brother into the business and then boom, I hit. And once I started working with Tom Cruise, since Jerry Maguire, um, I started traveling and going all over the place. And it was velvet handcuffs from there. Well, I was going to ask, did you go to Australia for two? Uh, no, no. I was just in, I was in Utah okay. and in LA. Wow. Yeah. And I witnessed Tom going out on that ledge and across the way, there was a, I think, I can't remember if it was a, a, a male or female, went off a, seven hood, a 700 foot cliff and was killed. And uh, while we were, you know, while we were shooting, I mean, it was so far away. Wait, a, what, a, a bird or a person or what was it? <laughs> Person, Charles. Person riding, a, riding, yeah, riding a bicycle. I was either riding a bicycle or hiking, and uh, what they had died. Yeah. So you just watched this happen and couldn't. Well, no, we couldn't. I mean, we didn't see it. We we were told, and Tom, you know, was uh, he's like he's he's fearless. So while I was there, you know, he went out on the ledge, which was like seven hundred and something feet, you know, off uh, high from the ground from below the cliff that we were at. And uh, just, he did it like we, he was five feet off the ground. And he looked off to see if you could see where the person fell or something? No, I, you know, I'm not, I, from what I remember, when we were there, there was talks about it. And we could see way off in the distance that something was going on over there. Then word got back to us that someone had fallen off the cliff. Wow. Oh, wow. So, yeah. A dark pallor over the making of Mission Impossible 2. Right. right. Good Lord. Which had, <laughs> it had nothing to do with our shoot. It was just somebody who was, you know, way off in the distance and uh, hiking, I guess. Oof. Good Lord. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Well, we're off off to an ominous start. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a campfire tale. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good Lord. Um, we have heard stories of uh, Mr. Cruz also providing fun food trucks. Do you remember him doing that on, on any of these? I, I was personally involved in okay. doing tell, that. Yeah. Tell us. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, you know, the great thing about Tom is he wants to make sure that the crew is taken care of, Yeah. you know, and, um, and he always wants to provide for them because he knows that everybody's dedicated and everyone's in there giving their all. And so what, you know, what a better way to uh, take care of everyone, everyone at the end of the night or during the course of the day. And, Sometimes he'll bring out, you know, two trucks at a time for whatever. But um, that's Tom, you know, right. being dedicated to the crew and making sure that they're they're taken care of. So, you know, we would have different kinds of trucks, whether it was a vegan truck or, you know, in and out truck or, um, you know, uh, Thai food or Italian. You know, it, it, it was just a it was a collection of or an eclectic collection of different types of food. Right. So but. Did you ever see him indulge in any of these or was this just for the crew? Oh, there were times when he would do it. You know, there were okay. times when okay. he would do it. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's part of that, but you know, once again, when he gets involved in, in, in production, he's involved and, um, and you don't see much of him, you know, fooling around because he's so focused. Yes. You know? Yes. We've collected stories throughout this podcast. I think we've heard him, he ate some M&Ms one time. We have a witness to that. He had a Diet Coke one time. Yeah, so, I don't think he's drinking Diet Coke anymore. No, so. probably not. I mean, his body is a temple and he has to do crazy things. But if he if he went in and indulged in a, you know, double-double from in and out I think that would be, we'd love to hear it. So I'm glad that he is, you know, taking part. Yeah, I didn't personally see it, but okay. I knew that there were moments when he was, you know, he was doing it. We try to get at least two witnesses per snack, right? If we can, you know, to verify. Um, yeah. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> well. So yeah, what do you? What else do you remember about the making of of two? I know that I was. Uh, um, they had called me. the The first AD had called. The second AD had called me and said, uh, "Mike, come over here. We want to look at your hands." And I said, "Why?" And uh, 
I went over and showed them my hands. They said, okay, go get dressed up. And I ended up getting, uh, going into with uh, the costumes and getting dressed as, as one of the characters in there. Uh, Do you remember who? Oh yeah. Philip Seymour, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, wow. And I went into, uh, in the bathroom sequence when he's washing his hands before he gets taken. So they did, I don't know what they kept in there, if it was close up of my hands or whatever, you know, and I, I, you know, it didn't matter to me. I wasn't, I wasn't looking to say, Hey, you got to pay me for this, whatever. I just did it. And JJ has been great to me. So I did that. And then there's sequence when they take Philip Seymour Hoffman out of the, um, the vehicle where he's being transported. Yes. You know, it's the armored vehicle. Yeah. So I was I, I was in that. I think there's pictures of me somewhere, you know, of doing that. But I don't know what made it because they I know they did shots of like the uh, the chains that were on my feet and on my hands and whatnot. So it was just close ups of that. You know. <laughs> so what made what made you a Philip Seymour Hoffman body double? Did you ask? I guess I'm Irish and I have like the same, you know, coloring as him. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But Yeah. And you also you actually had a part in three too, aren't you? Like a hospital employee? Yeah, I was. I was outside. Um, believe it or not, that it was the day my father passed away, and I was outside. And uh, uh, I think it was Tommy Harper who was was on the show. He said, uh, "I think JJ wants to talk to you." And JJ said, "Mike, come on in here." I didn't let on about my dad, and and I went in, and they said, "You're going to sit here, and Tom's going to come up and talk to you." And uh, you know, we just did it. He came out. And shook, there's a picture of me shaking his hand you know, with, with that. And, uh, um, it was, you know, just a moment of him looking for his wife and me saying, I've no idea, you know, I've no idea. Yeah. And that was uh, real quick. Do you think your character was responsible at all for her abduction? Have you thought about this? <laughs> uh, probably somewhere, somewhere, yeah. Maybe, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> he was in on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, you know, I think he might carry around that guilt a little bit, you know, that he was responsible. <laughs> There's a part of me. There's a part of me that feels Listen, that way. Listen, Michael, yes. I'm not going to tell you how to craft your character, no. you know. But I'm just saying there might be. <laughs> uh, do you have any funny uh, Philip Zimmer Hoffman stories? Because we've heard we've we've heard the gamut. Let's just say that. You know, Philip was very. Um, he was dedicated as well to his character, and he was he's very quiet offset. You know, offset. So there wasn't much of that. I don't think, from what I've heard. I don't think Philip was really like um, into behind the scenes. He didn't. He didn't want to reveal secrets. That was okay. one of the things that that um, that I remember him. You know, somebody talking about saying that you know that we should just be showing these movies and people should just see the magic on film rather than saying, "Oh, that's how they did it." You know. Right. So, and you know, to a certain extent, I, I agree with him. You know, but it's always it's great for filmmakers to learn what's going on when you can't afford film school. And, um, you know, you can watch what's going on, question things and, and learn. Right. So, I mean, you have to you have to set up the catering in some sometimes some crazy places. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What what's the craziest in regards to this fr franchise? Where is the craziest place that you've set up craft services? I mean, I was we were in the desert and I was on the edge of some some hill, you know, and the truck was uh, uh, was tilted and we had to, you know, get the guys out to bring them out for it. And then one time I was in Virginia on Evan Almighty and, um, you know, me being from New York originally, upstate New York, um, I know what a hailstorm is and a thunderstorm and lightning storm. And I was with a bunch of guys that I had hired from California and we were on the pad where the ark was built. And here comes this storm, this lightning storm. And the guys are on a quad doing spins around the, the mud and I'm in the truck and I'm screaming at them. And sure enough, a lightning bolt hit the pad and these guys shit their pants and ran right back into the truck. So that was probably <laughs> one of the most craziest moments I've had on a, on a set. What about anything on a mission impossible anywhere? Like when you were, did you go out to the, uh, I guess that was second unit, the, the windmills. Um, yeah. But yeah, were, were you in anywhere crazy for any of these? No, that that I mean, you know, when I was on the one in Dubai, let me tell you, I, I was with my, I had like I had a driver, and we had to go out to go to the desert to see, to check the location, and we're driving along the road, and I see up over the crest off the side these two camels come running along the side of the road, and I'm thinking somebody's camels got out. He said no, they're 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 wild. They just run. But if you hit them. 
It's like ki killing the American eagle, uh, the bald eagle, and you're going to jail, you know, if uh, something like that happens. Listen, Michael, so, you're a caterer. Yeah. I'm just saying you wouldn't let that meat go to waste. Not you know at all. I mean, no Not body, <laughs> no crime, nope. you know? No one would know. No, no one would know. know. <laughs> exactly. Wow. And, and you know, we were up in the, in the Burj Khalifa, which uh, um, Tom, uh, which was really amazing for it to, see, to see the windows moved, you know, taken away. Everybody had to be harnessed in. And then Tom would go out at 15 minutes at a time, literally on the side of the building. And um, once again, you know, we, we were above the clouds at times when we were going to, to scout it. So um, that was uh, pretty wild. And one night he did, I was, I always try, before I go to a location, I always try to like do some research and find out. And I found, I made friends with the guys who own uh, Fat Burger. And while I was, when I was there, I said, I'm going to Dubai. And the guy, the owner had said to me, we're in Kuwait. I said, You're, you, you have a fat burger in Kuwait? He said, yeah. He says, if you want it in Dubai, just let me know and I'll set it up. So Tom had wanted to do something for the crew. And uh, I found a racetrack. And you know how Tom is with racing. Yes. He's very competitive and he's really good. And so we set up a, a, a time for that. And I surprised everybody by bringing out the uh, fat burger in, in Dubai, which everybody was blown away by that. So That's crazy. You know, yeah. And also the kind of Dubai um, restrictions. I I went and I remember like you couldn't get like anything that's preserved in an alcohol. You couldn't get. Yeah. So did that affect your catering? And also, what is what are you handing Tom who's dangling outside above the clouds? I mean, is he like eating a kind bar out there and throwing the wrapper back in? How does he kind of stay going? I mean, Tom had um, Doug. His a guy that was his right hand man, Doug. That's been a friend of mine as well, Doug Weaver. And uh, Doug would take care of him. As you okay. know, as soon as he as soon as he came out, if he needed to eat, you know, he ate at certain times, and uh, he was very you know careful about what he was eating. You know, Tom wasn't putting anything that was going to you know compromise uh, his performance, you know, into his body. So um, he's very very conscious of that. Yeah, I would not want to be hangry. And also dangling out there as well. So I hope, I'm glad that he was taken care of. You know, Tom, yeah. the great thing about Tom, I also did, I did a little scene which was cut out of uh, Jerry Maguire. I had a scene with Tom and Cuba Gooding. And um, I just noticed, you know, when I went on set and being a director myself, I just watched Tom preparing beforehand and just snapping into character, you know, and, um, and this the way he was in Dubai. As soon as he was there checking safety, making sure things go on, and then he got into character and went out out the building. Bye. That was it. Wow. So, yeah. So you uh, you traveled to China for three and to Dubai for four. Is that right? Yeah. And I was also in um, – well, from Mission Impossible. I was also in uh, Japan and, and uh, New Zealand for uh, Last Samurai. So are you traveling with all of your – with all the – food or are you get, get, are you sourcing food yeah, it's, from I, those I, places I, I, over my back yeah no no i mean <laughs> i mean you just have to go to those places and then find all the stuff there is that how it works yeah what happens is you know i have a truck but i can't take my truck you know on a plane so i get there i get a support staff and um and we go out and uh we make sure that uh we can acquire whatever food uh, everybody has different choices of things. You know, there's a caterer, but I would do, I would, I would set up for early in the morning when we first get there. If the call time is seven o'clock, I'm there around five and then I'm there until after we wrap and I've got to provide food and, um, things to drink throughout the day. What's the weird, what, what do you have to import? Like, what's the weirdest thing you've had to, you've had to bring on? So someone had a, had a weird request, I'm sure. No, you know, no one was really, no one was ever demanding. I mean, no one. No one was ever demanding except for Tommy Lee Jones on, on a movie that I did, but nobody else. Was. Wait a, wait a minute. Hold on. I actually, <laughs> I grew up with, with Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, did so you? I have to now, I was, I was very good friends with his son growing up. Charles has heard this story a million times. So now I have to know what Tommy Lee, what, what he was pitching a fit about. Well, he wasn't pitching a fit, but he was, he was standing on the side of a car and he was looking like, you know, at some pictures and I walked up and my brother had, who got me in, you know, and I got him in there. Um, 
my brother had done uh, Men in Black. Okay. And I walked up and, you know, he was looking at these pictures and I said, uh, Mr. Jones, my brother did Men in Black with you. If there's anything that you want, please let me know. And he's looking like this and then he just looks up at me for like what was a lifetime of silence. <laughs> and then he looked back down and I just, I went like this and... And then later on, his driver gave me a, a piece of paper that was folded up like an origami, you know, and he hands it to me. And I opened the paper up. And it was huge. And it said in the middle of it said, Texas Ruby Red Grapefruit. And we don't have Texas Ruby Red Grapefruit here. So the next day I, I had it shipped out. I left it, you know, on his trailer. Never heard from him. Never said thank you or anything. And at the end of the show, he's driving past me when I'm wrapping up. And he just whistled and does this. And that was it. Give you a wink? Yeah, just a wink and a nod and <laughs> going on. So that's a that's a what? big thank you from Tommy Lee, probably. What, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, everybody that I've ever worked with actor wise, you know, an actress, everybody's been really good to me. I've never had a an issue with anyone. And Tom Tom's been Tom was always good to me. Well, I mean, you've done so many things with him. You Yeah, where else did you go for for Ghost Protocol, because they were all over the place. That one. Were you in Montreal? It was Vancouver, right? No, no. I was only. I mean, the only times I for for the mission for missions, I was in the the U.S., China, and Utah, and all over the states. You know, from when okay. we did that, I didn't go and Dubai, obviously for yeah. you know, for that. But um, China, I um, I actually created. I don't know if you if you guys got to see it. it was uh, called Catering Impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. We've, we watched that. You you directed that, right? It was a behind the scenes featurette. Well, what happened was the caterer said to me, "Hey, Mike, let's uh, come up with an idea for a show of me serving the crew," and I said, "I don't know how interesting that is, you know, of just somebody grabbing a burrito, or whatever, you know." <laughs> and so, um, so we waited, and then about maybe I don't know a couple of weeks later, I got the call that to, that we were going to China, and I said, "When?" It was from I think it was, I don't know if it was from Tom's office or from. JJ's office. And they said, we're leaving, we're leaving in uh, the end of October and you'll be back in December. And I said, isn't that during Thanksgiving? And they said, yeah. And boom, it hit me. I called the caterer up. I said, I got it. I said, you're going to China, right? He said, yeah. I said, I got the idea. It's you pulling off Thanksgiving in China. So I went to, um, I went to Paula Wagner and I told her, I said, how'd you like a million dollars worth of publicity for free? And she said, what? And I, I told her and she said, go see this guy at Paramount. We pitched, my partner and I pitched to Paramount and uh, we, uh, they said, uh, yeah, do it. What do you need? And I just said, access to the set with camera people and uh, uh, I'll shoot whatever I can here. So I did that, went to uh, China, hired some guys. And there was a, there was a moment where we were in this hotel and there's a rotisserie and that's where we put all the turkeys to cook them. And the Chinese chef said you needed to put in a, I guess, a 12 and a half to 12 and a half feet, or no, 12, 12 inch to, to 18 inch inches of coal beneath it. And the our caterer said, you only need four inches. So I was in my, my room. I had been shooting everything and sending, uh, uh, you know, footage back to uh, the States and I'm sleeping. And I think it was like three o'clock in the morning and I got a phone call and they said, get down right away to the uh, to the kitchen. I said, why? There's a fire. So I grabbed my camera, ran outside, got in the elevator. And when I got in the elevator, I realized I was in my underwear. And I went down and sure enough, the kitchen was so smoke. And, you know, they had, they had, now they had to use these little ovens and cut the turkeys up and cook because we had to do it that next day. And, uh, and they pulled it off, you know, so. So was it because of the lack of coal? No, it was because of too much coal. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that was the argument. And, you know, we wanted to do this right, and then Tom you know, Tom knew about it. In fact, you know, after that had happened, there was an announcement when, when we were doing the, uh, the Thanksgiving feast, and they said, whatever you do, don't go in the water. You know when Tom runs, on the, uh, runs along the, uh, uh, that little village? Yeah. So there's a waterway there. People are washing their clothes. People are, are brushing their teeth. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty bad. And I saw this, these kids and I had, you know, I'm always taking pictures on my phone and I was leaning over and I leaned over too far and I fell in the water and I got out real quick. And then, uh, when they're about to shoot the sequence, when Tom was running, they stopped everything and brought me out and said, uh, 
did you fall in the water? And of course I had to, you know, I had to tell them because then everybody backed off thinking I had some disease, you know, or something that I acquired while I was in the water. <laughs> so those are this the guys moments. touching all your meals now. Too, right. So deal with it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, what was it like working with Brad Bird? Your two two timer club been on uh, two films with him. Yeah, he's uh, he's great. He's uh, he's very detailed about things that you know that he wants. I mean, because he comes from animation, so um, you know, I I think I went out parasailing with him uh, with the writers uh, one afternoon. We had never done that, you know, off a boat, and uh, Brad was the you know Brad was there. We we talked a little bit, but he's. You know, it's a it's a whole different world when you get on set and you watch. You're looking at people that are so driven and so focused on, you know, the the story and um, and also the physicality of what we have to do during the course of the day. I mean, it's like it's like a military operation. You know, you've got to take that hill and you have a certain amount of time. And if you get to the top, then you've made that day. And if not, you're backing off. You've got to you've got to make up for it. You know. Yeah. But Brad was uh, Brad was was great. What did you give him to keep him energized? You know, I, I, I didn't. Lots uh, of coffee, I imagine. I, yeah, I didn't see much. I mean, he didn't see much of him, you know. Okay. Once in a while, he would, you know, he'd come on the truck, whatever. But, um, you know, we we had the truck and then we had a setup outside and people would come up and I'd be bouncing back and forth. And I had a bunch of guys working for me. So we, I know we were at Paramount Studios, you know, uh, set up on stage as well. So we didn't have any of those. We call those redneck redneck lattes. <laughs> it is a redneck latte. I yeah. agree. Um, tell me about your hat. Oh, this. So about five, six years ago, you know, I have, I get little sunspots and everything else. And I was on a Mission Impossible and um, a woman who I know, her husband who works at CBS, she was on a, she was a nurse and she was, she had breast cancer and she was on the table getting operated and she had a seizure and they pulled the plug and she lost 42 years of her memory, wiped clean, even till this day. And uh, she said to me, um, we, you know, we talked about that. And I told her about my, my condition. If I, you know, I, have to, I can't really go out in the sun too much without being covered. And uh, she said, would you wear a pink hat? And I thought, why? And she said, well, because everybody talks to you on the set. And, you know, you might be talking to someone about that. It's for breast cancer. And jokingly, I said, I'd wear one for the rest of my life. So that was five years ago. And I, the two weeks after I got 50 hats in the mail and I've been wearing, I got a second batch and this is the 32nd hat of the second batch. And uh, I'll only wear this hat. So anytime people see me, they say, are you ever going to wash that thing? You know? And uh, this is, uh, this is what it's for. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of hats too. You're going through. Right? Yeah. And then I give them to like, you know, my DP, I gave one to him and I, I gave a bunch out to the crew that I was directing uh, a film on and everybody keeps saying to me, why don't you ask Tom to be in something, you know? Right. And I, you know, that's not, you, you can't go that route, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or else I'd go to every actor that I worked with, you know? Right. So, right. But I would never do that. Uh, I want to go back deep in your uh, filmography here. It says you were a production assistant on Last Boy Scout. Yeah. You remember any stories from that set? Tony Scott, anything good? Yeah, I, we, we were we were shooting at um, the uh, we were shooting at um, the Coliseum. Yeah. And they they had given me a, a microphone, and I was uh, I, I just went up and started you know entertaining the crowd, and uh, there was a guy that there that was there that ended up years later becoming a craft service guy. And he was wearing, he had long, he looked like Tom Petty, you know, a dirty Tom Petty. And uh, he had a Bible in his hand and a guitar in his back. And I went up and I said, uh, excuse me, sir. I said, is it wrong for one man to love another man? And he just started going through the Bible, you know, like this. And he started spouting off what it was. And, you know, the whole the crowd broke off. And years later, he comes tapping me on the shoulder. He says, it's okay for one man to love another man. Can I get a job? And he became... Uh, craft service guy on the show <laughs> so wow but tony scott was uh he was great i i i gotta tell you he uh you know for that for 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 that show itself how dedicated he was and how every, you know he comes from the world of art 
And uh, watching him really taught me so much about filmmaking. Was Bruce nice to you or not? I didn't really, you know, I didn't, right. I didn't, you know, I was a PA at that time. Okay. So I didn't bump into him, you know? Right. And, and plus, you know, it, my early in my career, my first job was Sylvester Stallone's assistant on Rocky four working when he was working out. And I was a little, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was in the, in the gym with Dolph and, and Carl Weathers and all these big name boxers. And, uh, I slowly just started saying, they're just, you know, they're just people, you know? And I think that was one of the great things that um, taught me a lesson about not getting, you know, too crazy. When I walk away from things, you know, after I've hung out with, whether it's Tom or, or Philip Seymour Hoffman or John Travolta or somebody, you know, you say afterwards, holy shit, I was just there 20 minutes talking to this guy and, you know, right. other people would kill for that, but they're people. You know, what was going on in that Rocky Four gym? Any uh, any funny business? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> no, actually, Sly told me not to let uh, Carl see Dolph when uh, you know when he was working out because he wanted to reveal Dolph's whole physique when they got on uh, when they were in front of camera. And uh, I got to tell you, man, Dolph is his reach. I, I was in the gym with him, you know, sometimes shadow boxing for whatever. And his reach is so far that I thought I was far enough away from him. And he could, the, he, I would feel the wind, you know, from, from his uh, boxing glove. But they were, even Carl Weathers. Carl, Carl Weathers looks like somebody carved his whole body out, you know. Isn't Dolph like a scientist or genius or something too? I think he is. But I also also think he's like a, a double black belt in some martial arts uh and I think at the time he was dating Grace Jones, so she was there working out as well. Oh, wow. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then, and I can't remember the, the actor's name. He was actually in Enemy of, the, Enemy of the State, which I worked on, and he was, he played the boxer. He played, oh, God, I can't remember his name now. He played a boxer that the, the story about, I think, um, Mancini? Uh, not Mancini. I can't remember. God, I mean, there's so many people. You know, they'd come through that threshold in there. Yeah. You know, and it's just, you know, I'll tell you one of the, probably one of the best moments uh, I had, I was doing Last Action Hero. And um, I, the, the producer asked me to bartend during the time when all the actors were coming in to go into the stage. And I was a bartender when I first moved out to California. And uh, this guy comes behind the bar and whispers to me, I'm going to help you. And it was Tony Curtis. And Tony Curtis and I ended <laughs> up tending bar. At this why was place. why was Tony Curtis on the set of Last Action Hero? Uh, to tell you the truth, I have no idea, but I think he was. I don't know if he was cut out of it. I think like James was it. Bill wait, wait, was it for the film premiere scene or something? Is that because they had a lot of movie stars there for the film premiere scene in Last Action Hero? Is that what yeah, the scene yeah, was you were shooting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe he maybe he was going to be in that scene. Yeah, there was a. I mean, that green room was filled with people that were uh, that you that you'd all know. Everybody know. I think there might be. You and Tony Curtis tending bar might have been a welcome addition to that movie, too. I'm just saying, I think that would have been a great. <laughs> did, you have, did you have any interaction with John McTiernan? We we both love him. Oh yeah, I was always on set watching him. He's another great director, you know. And and uh, um, I was wa watching what he did because you know he did Die Hard, and um, I remember the sequence that was on the rooftop, which was on stage, and what uh, you know when they had the crane there. Uh, and, and moving it. In fact, what one of the things that I was doing, Dean Semler was the DP, and I wanted to learn about camera. So I always put myself in a position where I was near D, uh, Dean to learn about camera during that time. And uh, and his camera operator was was end up being my DP on a short film that I did that went to Sundance. So um, you know, it's just a, I took advantage of the opportunity to you know as a filmmaker to learn from everything from. You know, Chris Peck is a friend of mine. Um, Love him. Yeah, yeah great we guy. To Chris. Yeah, he's. Uh, we have some stories um, when we were in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <it's>, okay. Yeah. <laughs> say no more. <laughs> we'll have to do it together. If if I yes. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it without him. So we'd have to do it sometime when we were both. Uh, you know, on lucid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You also worked on uh, Blood In, Blood Out. Briefly. And I, you know, and um, the director, 
Taylor Hackford, I remember my brother had worked for him, but ne my brother never warned me about him. And I remember, you know, during the time when people are setting up camera, I walked out with a, a tray of food and he went off on me for like 10 minutes about you don't come near me or the crew or the camera with any food. And uh, I learned my lesson. And it wasn't he wasn't being an ass. He just, you know, he was dead. Once again, he was focused and um, and that would disrupt everything because everybody would be grabbing something. They're in the middle of eating, you know, and uh, moving camera. So uh, I learned my lesson quickly on that show. Hopefully he uh, doesn't snap at Helen Mirren like that. No, I don't think he no, does. No, okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Charles, go ahead and ask your panic room question. Oh, I didn't. I I uh, missed that. Yeah, so you worked on Panic Room. All right. Any any Fincher, David Fincher stories? Uh, I think he did over a hundred takes on, um, yeah, yeah, on a, a certain scene, you know. And I just everybody, you know, it was it was it was pretty crazy because you know I guess Nicole Kidman was up for the role and was in there, and then they made the change, and uh, um, also. Um, I got to see Jared Leto. That's the, one of the things that came in there. And I was fortunate enough to work on Blade Runner 2049 and watch Jared at work there, you know? So I've been just blessed to see directors and, um, and actors, you know, at work. I, you know, I, I, working with Tom, there is a story that I, I did on Jerry Maguire. Um, you know, Lee Stahlberg, I guess it is, uh, the, uh, the agent, the sports agent, mm -hmm. you know? So that was what Jerry Maguire was about. Yeah. And I there was a line of people that I had outside my truck and I was serving and it was all the extras. And, you know, I had this jar of pickles, sour pickles, and the, the tongs were there. And we would just, they would grab macaroni salad, potato salad. We'd give them chicken or whatever, veggies, whatever. And uh, this guy, he looked kind of homeless, comes up and um, he said, he reaches his hand in the pickles and puts it out and <laughs> spits it out on one of the extras plate. Well, I leaped off the truck running after him and he's walking into the set. And I, you know, I won't say the words that I said to him, but I, I, I jumped all over him about it. And he says, all right, you made your point. You made, I said, made my point. And he walked away. So I told my guys to cover and I went in there and Hope Parrish, who's our prop master. And I'm looking around like this. And she says, what's the matter, Mike? I said, this guy comes up and pickle <laughs> spits it out. He said, there he is. He's over by Video Village. She says, oh, yeah, that's who the movie's about. I said, I don't care. I said, I just you told him where it's at. I said, he's not allowed to come over by, you know, by my truck again. And then about maybe an hour or two later, I got a radio call. They said, Cameron Crowe wants to see you in the trailer. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm, in, I'm fired. And him and Tom were in the trailer. And they said, what, what happened? And I told them. And Tom cracked a smile. And Cameron cracked a smile. And he said, don't worry about it. It's okay. That's the way he is. And I left it, but I would not allow him near me again. I didn't care wow. who he was. Yeah. You know, because everybody, you know, everybody treats each other on set with respect. Most times me with me, you know, they do. And um, the movies that st stood out most, you know, um, working on multiplicity, working on all the, the Mission Impossibles, you know, and having an actor that uh, uh, is dedicated to his craft and, and also is very respectful of other people. So wow. I've just, yeah, I've had a, I've had a good ride. Well, I think that's a perfect uh, note to end on. We want to thank you so much for, for coming on. Do you want to, do you have anything you want to plug before we go? No, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to say something about something that I'm doing. I mean, we're in the works of something, but I don't want to do it. If it, you know, if something falls through, I'd rather not I'd rather say that. Okay. Well, you keep us posted and we'll, we can always talk about it later. Absolutely. But you know what I would love to do? I would love to get together with you guys with Chris Peck. Anytime. <laughs> That'd be great. I think Chris Chris was in, we we actually hung out with Chris. When was that, Charles? Uh, like, it was a few months ago, at least now. Yeah. Uh, last year, at some point, maybe in the summer. I'm not sure. But we want to get it. We want to get him back now because he also worked on Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you should, uh, and my, my DP worked on that as well on second unit, but uh, John Connor. But you should, when you see him, ask him two things. So ask him, number one, what happened in the redneck bar when you were doing Mouse Hunt with Kehoe? And then ask him, what did F. Murray Abrams say to both of you guys? 
Okay. Well, I, but we, we're going to have you guys on together. So now you're going to have to tell these stories. Okay. Wow. Okay. okay. We'll do it. All right. We'll do it. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for, for coming on and we will keep in touch. Guys, it's great being here. Thank you. Oh, that never gets old. Uh, I love, I love it when you come out of. The, yeah, that's great. I just love, I love, I love that uh, that way of coming out of the interview. It's just there's nothing better. I, <laughs> just, just checking just to see if you're awake. Music to my ears. Yeah. Uh, we're... <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was great. Uh, you know, it's, it's also, also you know, like I said at the beginning of the episode, he's also a filmmaker. It's it's interesting that he while he was doing some of the uh, the catering for Mission Impossible 3, that he also directed the behind-the-scenes Food Network special called Catering Impossible, uh, you know, about him making the Thanksgiving dinner for everyone and the crew in Shanghai. So I, I've, I've watched it. I think it's on the, the Blu-ray special features. I think it's also in the, the special features if you have the digital version, or maybe it depends. Actually, I think we did a whole Patreon about all the different... I think that was the... That's the... Um, I, I think it's on the iTunes version. Yeah, there's the MI3, I think, more than any other movie in the series, has different special features for different versions. But it's a fun uh, special to check out, uh, for sure. Uh, great work by Michael there. And, uh, yeah, of course, I loved, uh, I think my favorite part of the chat was the Tommy Lee Jones story. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) With the Texas ruby red grapefruit and the origami note. It's just so weird and great, and I love it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) That's Tommy Lee And I love that you have a personal connection to him as well. Yes, yeah, I grew up with Tommy Lee, and... um... He never demanded anything of me, but I was a little kid, so hopefully he knew that I could not uh, <laughs> go get these special things for him on request. But yeah, he's a character. Yes. He is a real character. Love yeah. that. Um, I don't have anything else other than I, of course, want to tell everyone to sign up for our Patreon. Uh, as we mentioned, we did an episode about our Beyond Fest adventure, seeing Ghost Protocol in IMAX. That's a great episode that we did where we talk for a while about everything that we learned there and who we talked to and catching up with Brad Bird and all that stuff. Uh, we also have done other episodes about... We did one recently about the Predator franchise, which was a good one. Uh, there's always great stuff. We have bonus episodes every week, so please sign up at patreon.com slash lightthefuse. Uh, we also have uh, merchandise, which you can buy, which that, that supports the show. If you can go to our website, lightthefusepodcast.com, go to the merch tab, then uh, you can be linked there to our T Public page, which has all of our shirts and masks and other things that you can buy, stickers, buttons. Also on our website, you can uh, go to the episode guide and check out the show notes for all of our past episodes. It's a great uh, visual companion to uh, the audio of this podcast. Um, what else, Drew? Well, you have some shout outs, and then I have a couple of things to remind people oh, of. Yes, great. Thank you for reminding me. I have to give a special thank you to Nathan Lawrence. Derek Klingle, and Digifin Media. So thank you, Nathan, Derek, and Digifin Media. Uh, couldn't do this episode without you. I also want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our composer, Kevin Blumenfeld. And what else did you have to do? Well, I just wanted to tell people to obviously follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod on Instagram and Twitter. And to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And just to get the word out, you know, tell your friends, to stop people on the street, you know, um... And uh, let us know what you want to hear from us. Uh, so reach out and, uh, you know, chances are we'll either turn it into an episode or a Patreon episode. And, yeah, I really can't stress enough how fun the Patreon is and how much you really should be a part of it. So, yeah. You want to talk about what we're doing next week or well, I just think, let people uh, speculate? A little let people speculate. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to figure it out ourselves. We do have some really exciting things in the works that we can't talk about yet. But, uh, yeah, we're excited for the future. So we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be coming back at you every Friday with something. That, that sounds like a threat, Charles, but I do enjoy it. And we, <laughs> it's we always will a be threat. back. You know it's a it threat. It's always a threat. <laughs> yes, we will be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, for Charles, this is Drew. Bye.
Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.